Hello Noble Ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Today I would like to talk about white Italian armour versus German Gothic armour. Now in the Middle Ages obviously armour was used all over Europe but these but northern Italians and southern Germans were the best armourers. And the styles were different, so we will examine the differences. But as we enter the 16th century, towards the end of the 16th century, these two styles had become almost undis undistinguishable, okay? So they, they become very similar. But it's, it's interesting to see in the 15th century how these two styles were very, very different. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this video. So please, at the end of this video, please let me know which armour you prefer. If you prefer the Gothic armour or if you prefer the white Italian armour. Please let me know in the comments below. All right then, without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start by asking a question. What is white armour? Because before analysing a white Italian armour, we need to understand what white armour means. White armour, basically, it's a full body steel plate without a surcoat, to make it simple, or a coat of arms, like they said, uh, like it was known in England. So if we imagine a, um, until like the uh, 14th century, if we imagine a knight, they were using surcoats. But uh, as the 15th century armour developed, they, um, they started to have these new styles of armour that um, did not use, they actually were showing the uh, full plate, the, the metal parts. And so considering that both Gothic armour and Italian armour uh, alla Milanese, uh, they are both, um, you know, without surcoats, we could say that they are both white armour at the end of the day. So when I, I, that's why I specify white Italian armour against Gothic armour, that's how it's not more commonly known. I would like to begin with the term Gothic. Now, it, it can be a misleading term, so we need to be careful. We have the same term in art history, for example, but that term, the term Gothic in art, covers from the 12th century to the 15th century. Now, when we talk about Gothic plate armour, the situation is very different because the time span that we're actually looking at is only the 15th century and the, and the 16th century, in, you know, for, for its peak with Maximilian armour that I will talk about in a moment. So, anyways, we are talking past 14. 20. Probably as someone looks at Gothic armour, the first thing that strikes the eye is floating. Now, I'll give you the definition of floating. Floating is, basically when we say flutings, we are talking about, or flutes, we are talking about the grooves formed by narrow pleats in cloth, we could say, but in this case in metal. But why was it done? Well, fluting is probably the easiest way to strengthen the armour without adding any weight, as they, ha they would play a role in deflecting the points and blades of uh, opponents, strengthening the structural strength of a plate, and also give some impact or blunt damage resistance. And just as a fun factor, we also have fluting in architecture. Moving to the helmet now, obviously a German salad. And I actually really like the look of, you know, the overbite between the visor and the lower part, the bever. This helmet I have already described in my channel has very good protection, particularly in the back, as you can see has this spike, particularly in German style, that covers the back of the head. Now moving to the Curas. And yes, I have finally managed to learn how to pronounce this word. It just took me 13 years of studying English, considering that I have learned English when I was 19. So anyhow, you know, better late than never. So what is the characteristic of the Gothic Curas as we compare it, as opposed to the Italian Curas? Well, first of all, if we look at them one next to the other, we notice that in, the, in Italy, we, we kind of had this, uh, we kept the strap, the leather strap in the middle to connect the uh, breastplate to the part over there that you see over it, which is called a placard. 
So what is a placard? A placard is a characteristic of the 15th century armour and basically it was a plate reinforcement that composed the bottom part of the front of the medieval breastplate. Initially, they covered the lower half of the front torso, but as time and, te and technology progressed, it kind of went up, covering also partially the torso, so that we have an overlapping, a double layered protection in the very core of the knight. Now, in the German Gothic style, as you can see, we have a very decorated placard secured by rivets. Now, in the Italian version, we have the leather stripe. So, in the Italian version, we have more mobility. You can actually move the, the placard and the breastplate independently. You do not have as much mobility in the German Gothic style. Now, of course, when someone sees the leather strap, the first thing that comes to mind is the idea of, of someone cutting it. But again, Italians did it, we did it for over a century. So that's almost three generations in the Middle Ages. So, um, it must have worked. And again, it's a choice. Now, before moving to the Italian white armour, I would like to spend a word about Maximilian armour. Maximilian armour is kind of the evolution of Gothic armour, although evolution is kind of a difficult term sometimes, but still, it is the following, okay, because we're already in the 16th century here. Now, with Maximilian armour, fluting reaches, uh, as you can see, it kind of covers everything, although, well, almost everything, because normally greaves are never uh, covered in, in fluting, but for the rest of it, as you can see, it is all fluted. The name comes from Maximilian I, the Emperor Maximilian I. Now, what's characteristic of this armour is that it's a bit more, quite more rounded compared to earlier Gothic. So all those spikes, they become more rounded and more curved. The ridges were narrower, parallel to each other, and as I said, covered the entire armour. In my opinion, it would be a mixture between the curves and roundness of Italian armour and the fluting of Gothic armour. So if you like both, you can't make up your mind, Maximilian could be a good idea. A fun factor, now if you, have, if you are players of Dark Souls, you will have recognised it immediately, as the armour in Dark Souls is very, very similar to a fluted Gothic Maximilian armour. Also, the helmet, as you can see, is not a solid anymore, and this would still, the Maximilian helmet is very similar to, a, to an armoured, if you can see, it's still different, but I would say it is a fluted armoured to help you visualise it. Italian armour, Italian armour. My goodness, this looks beautiful. I mean, I really like Gothic armour too, but what can I do? I'm Italian. Maybe it's because I'm Italian, but it looks just fantastic. Now, apart from the looks, though, um, let's get into the actual differences. So, the first thing to say, of course, we don't have fluting here, so we lose that protection advantage compared to Gothic armour. However, there are two very positive things. First thing, asymmetric pauldrons, as you can see. So, when you see that, for example, the left pauldron is bigger and the right pauldron is smaller, that is Milanese, so Milanese, uh, Northern Italian style. So, why did we have a symmetry here? Well, the reason for that is not the looks. It looks good, but it's not for the looks. The, the, the bigger pauldron is the left one because that's your line of defence. So, that's where you probably will receive most of your blows from a right-handed opponent. So, it needs to be bigger because basically that's what you use to defend. The right pauldron, on the other hand, is smaller not only because you don't need as much um, defence over there, but also to grant more mobility to the right arm, which is your striking arm, and the arm that you, that you will use also to use the lance or the sword, in both cases. And ultimately, it also leaves space for the lance rest, which I have already illustrated in the in my video, A Knight in Shining Armour. Now, secondly, we have, Italians had this, this we had this very good way of covering with plate armour those parts that beforehand were only covered in mail. So, perhaps less protection overall, but more protection to the joints. Now, moving to the helmet, we have quite a few variations and quite a few possible helmets in Italian style, but I will uh, talk about the armour, I'll focus on the armour. Now, as you can see, um, there is a difference, between, a huge difference, and that's very the very ingenious introduction of the wrapper. 
Now, what the wrapper does, it wraps around the um, the front uh, of the helmet in order to, to provide double protection. And this was very convenient, particularly during jousts, where, you know, it could happen that you would get the entire force of a lance in your face. So in that case, double layered protection and also very good protection for the collar. Now you have to consider that until the 16th century the breastplate did not, there was a gap between the helmet and the actual uh, breastplate or the, you know, the gorget. And the wrapper was there to provide defense and, and avoid a, the point of a blade to get through and only had to deal with mail. Now, still in the Italian style, we have a skirt of mail. And no, that's not only for women. Male knights used the skirt of mail. And it was there to protect the growing area. And sometimes Italians wore over it also a shirt of mail. So what you had was an arm in doublet, a skirt of mail, a shirt of mail, breastplate, placard. Five layers. That's why I get mad when I see these programs and videos on YouTube that say um, piercing testing and they have this Indian sheet metal breastplate wrapped uh, around a pole being pierced with katanas and long sword. It, it, five layers. I'm just saying this. Five layers. I'll, I'll leave the rant for another video. Now, before concluding this video, I would like to express my thanks to modern medievalists and particularly to my friend Yannick Koch, who has helped me by providing a lot of interesting pictures, many of which I have used in this video. He's a very knowledgeable person. And I would also like to thank my friend Martin Holman, who is always there, also helping me out and advising me whenever I have a question. All right then, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please thumb up, let me know, share it with your friends, share it on your Facebook, help me grow. If my channel grows, I will be able to make more videos and more content like this because I'll be able to, to spare more time um, into this because it, it then would become almost a, like a job rather than, than just a hobby, just a hobby like it is at the moment. I know you can do it. Show me your power, noble ones. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.